Hi, I'm Jen from Tea Leaves and Tweed, and here I talk about all things tea. So if that sounds like something you'd like, be sure to subscribe to follow more of what I do. Today I have another historical tea video for you. Today we're talking about the role of the Portuguese in the history of tea in Western Europe, and we'll be drinking a special Portuguese tea. <laughs> Long time no see. If you are not subscribed to my Instagram or my blog or my new TikTok account, you probably haven't seen me for a while. I think it's been a few months. I've slowed down making videos and in fact, I've moved again. This is our new house and this is my new tea room. As you can probably see in here, it's a little empty right now, but this is going to get decorated with some beautiful art that I have display cabinets for all of my teaware, and of course, a lovely tea table, and maybe a new draining tea tray. So stay tuned for that. But in the meantime, I thought I would make a quick and dirty video because all of you seem to miss me. So here I am with just my phone and my cushion and a tea set to talk about the history of the Portuguese influence on the Western European tea trade. In fact, one of the first references or reports of tea in Western Europe came from a Portuguese missionary, Father Gaspar da Cruz, who visited China to evangelize to the Chinese. And while he was there, he noted that in any household of quality, when you got there, you could be expected to be greeted with a beverage that they called cha, which was a red medicinal, somewhat bitter beverage that they brewed from some local herbs. And this of course is tea, the beverage. And so the Portuguese were one of the kind of first contact with tea culture in China, uh, from Western Europe at least. And from there, they ended up not actually taking a large interest in the tea trade. They mostly focused on spices and they set up a trading port in Macau, but they did trade in tea. And in fact, those of you who are familiar with tea history may remember that a certain Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza, is credited with popularizing tea in the aristocracy of England because her dowry included several chests of tea. In fact, some apocryphal tales say that the word tea comes from the Portuguese abbreviation for tea on their chests. Pretty sure this is not true. However, I thought today that I would share with you the tea that kind of sparked people's interest in this historical tidbit, which is pipa cha, which is pipe tea. That is a kind of portmanteau word between the Portuguese word for a pipe, which is the cask that they store their wines in. If you're a fan of Edgar Allan Poe, you will remember the cask of Amontillado, which is a type of sherry, where they keep repeating a pipe. You have a pipe, you have a pipe of Amontillado, and a pipe is one of the vessels that they use to store large amounts of these aged fortified wines like sherry and like port, and cha, the Chinese word for tea. So pipa cha, pipe tea, is tea that has been aged in a port cask. So it kind of absorbs those port flavors, that kind of dried fruit, a little bit of that smoke, and in particular, this pipa cha, which I was gifted and was purchased from the Rare Tea Company. So I was gifted this tea by my mother-in-law because my family knows that if they don't know what to get me for a holiday, they can always get me tea. And she must have been trying to really wow me because I had not actually ever heard of this tea before. So I was very excited to receive it. But the tea was purchased from the Rare Tea Company. And I believe it comes from one distributor in Portugal. So I will link all the information down below in the info box. And of course, I will link my source, which is uh, the historical source, William Euchre's All About Tea, that I used for the historical record about 
the influence of the Portuguese in the tea trade. So perhaps the Portuguese brought back oolong tea because oolong was available in China uh, in the 16th century when the Portuguese first landed. And perhaps they brought it back to Portugal. Perhaps they ran out of space and they needed to stuff their tea into something. So they put it into an empty port cask and it picked up those beautiful flavors. Or perhaps like nowadays, they decided they wanted to see how the flavors melded similarly to how some of our local whiskey distilleries will swap barrels with our local chocolatier so that the chocolatier can have chocolate or cacao beans aged in a whiskey barrel and then the whiskey maker gets the barrel back and they have a whiskey barrel that has had cacao beans in it which they can then fill with more whiskey. This idea of melding flavors kind of exists throughout time. So let's see how tea and port do. Let's brew. So here I have my brewing setup. I'm going to warm up my teaware and rinse it out a bit. And now that I've warmed up my gawan, I can put our five grams of pipa cha. This is a dark oolong that has been aged in port barrels in the gawan to warm up warm up our cups and I have two cups out because lately my toddler has been joining me for morning tea so I tend to keep two cups out when I have tea okay we have this nice warmed up teaware I'm going to give it a little sniff mmm the dry leaf smells very oolongy and I apologize if you see any little bugs. I have a bit of a problem with fruit flies. One of my house plants ended up getting fruit flies. So let's steep our tea. I'm not going to give this a rinse because I find these loose teas don't tend to need much waking up. I'm just going to steep that. This is boiling water. We'll see what our first steeping looks like. a little cup. You can see that beautiful red color and one of the reasons I love that this is an oolong is in the historical record they talk about the tea being red and while red tea in Chinese usually refers to what we call black tea in the west I also think that roasted oxidized oolongs have this beautiful red color to them. Let's give it a taste! Mmm, I get some of that dried fruit already. I'm gonna smell the leaves. Oh, yes, the leaves bring in this just like whiny, rich, it doesn't smell like alcohol, but you get that roast from the oolong and then just this juicy fruitiness from the port. Reminds me of a really good port. <laughs> this is a delightful tea. It has this very juicy, round mouthfeel to it. Mm. It's almost silky. And I do get notes of dried fruit, a little bit of leather. I always love these leathery notes I get in aged oolongs. And that slight herbally medicinal flavor. Uh, I love that the kind of historical record talks about the medicinal quality of the tea, talking about the flavor, not saying that it is actually, that they were thinking of it as medicine, although tea was used as medicine a lot throughout its history. And I find it really interesting that Kind of the first contact that Western Europeans had with tea was this idea that the quintessential hospitality was that when someone comes into your house, you offer them tea. Which is something I can get behind. 
Um, and of course, I have a whole picture to myself because I'm not sharing right now. This is my beautiful new crane picture from uh, Pop of Cha. I got this yesterday. I love the set. I got the whole set with the cups, the gawan, and the pitcher, but I think the pitcher is my favorite. I've never had a, a gong dao bei like this that um, doesn't have a handle, and I really like it. I have another one coming, so. Definitely more beautiful tea wear in my future, so I guess I have to keep making videos to share that with you. Mm. But I think I wanna take this for another steeping. So I'm going to finish up this one and then I will meet you back at the tea set for a second steeping. Okay, I'm jumping the gun a little bit. I still have a little bit of tea left in my cups, but I wanna steep these leaves out and see how they do. We'll give that a little bit of time and drink my tea while I'm waiting. Oh yes, look at that beautiful kind of mahogany color. Nice big leaves. A little bit of an uneven oxidation on these. Although that could also be from leaves that had different levels of uh, contact with the sides of the barrel. If you look really closely, you can see that some of the leaves are a little bit darker than others. And I don't think this is because the roasting was done unevenly. I think it's either the oxidation or the aging gives it that variation in color. Let's give it a taste. Okay, so I have my second steeping. Let's give it a pour. Don't want to spill boiling hot tea on myself, like I've done in other videos. Ooh, I think the oolong comes through more in that one. I get a little bit more of the roast. I get a little bit more of that kind of savory quality to that oolong can have. I still got the uh, the fruits underneath it all though. Yeah, I definitely get more of the oolong character on this one. It's interesting. Mm. So I'm going to finish up my tea. I hope you enjoyed these two steepings of pipa cha, a Portuguese oolong that is aged in port wine casks, and a little tidbit about how the Portuguese influenced the history of tea in Western Europe. Thank you for joining me on this historical tea session and be sure to like and subscribe, comment below if you want to see anything in particular and I'll see what I can do. And of course, if you want to see more videos from me in a shorter form, I have a new TikTok channel, Tea Leaves and Tweed, and you can also follow me on any of my other social channels, which I will link in the info box below. Thanks for joining me.